still her daddy. I missed her growing up. I never heard her laugh or saw her run. We never sang or danced or played as much as a game of peekaboo. I have no idea what her favorite color might be, or her favorite food, or even the color of her eyes. I'm a male victim of abortion. And while it may be my story, I'm not the hero, really. And I'm not the victim. Like Elizabeth, I'm a beloved child who got separated from a loving father. But he could do something about it. Hi, my name is Reg Platt. Um, my early experience with Jesus was strong. I went to Catholic schools when I went to high school. It's my first time in public schools. That's when my faith started to get a little shaky. I drifted away from the church then. I mean, I still considered myself Catholic, but I wasn't really practicing it. And when I got to college, um, I turned into a complete pagan. And I'm a male victim of abortion. Most people think there's no such thing, but I lost my only child to abortion in 1976. I was uh, 19 years old at the time, and it, the situation wasn't that my, I was um, an unlucky lover or a clumsy one night stand. I was a newlywed. My wife and I of the time uh, had been married less than a month when we found out she was pregnant. Uh, I was overjoyed by this because we didn't think she could get pregnant. She had had an abortion many years before, and she thought that it had left her sterile. I didn't care. I loved her. I wanted to be with her. So when she said she was pregnant, uh, well, I was ecstatic. And then she said, but I want to get an abortion. See, she was an actress, and she had been cast in a summer musical where she was a dancing Indian princess maiden. And you can't be a dancing princess Indian maiden if you're four months pregnant. So inside I went, please don't do this. But outside I said, okay, dear, it's your body. It's your choice. I'll support whatever you want, which was my way of being a coward. Because I knew if I stood up to her about this, she'd leave. She was a strong-willed, liberated woman, and I knew it would end our marriage just like that. The irony is that six months later, our marriage was in shambles, had completely fallen apart. In fact, that summer, I started coming down with severe depression, anger. I had uh, suppressed everything about it, though. And I actually tried to kill myself that summer. I stood in the bathroom, and I had a razor blade, and I had it to my wrist, and then I looked at my reflection and I hated that disgusting creature in the mirror. I thought, oh, he deserved to die. I wasn't sure why, but I just knew he was because I was racked with guilt. And while I was looking deep into his eyes, God gave me the grace to see into them and see the Christ within which is something I hope 
I have with everybody that I meet now. But it was a new experience to me then. And I suddenly felt pity for that creature in the mirror. I felt like God had a plan going forward. I had no idea what it was, but he wasn't ready for me to go. So I put down the razor blade and I've never tried to do it again. And after we broke up, she came back to me and she said, I'm pregnant again. Can you help me? Well, by this time I had a heart of stone here in my chest. So I said, sure, yeah, let's go. I'll take you. So I took her to the same clinic where we killed our child. I sat in the same waiting room and I felt nothing. So I took her home afterwards and I left her there. And I thought, I've got to get out of Houston. So I moved up to Dallas. I thought, this is a good chance to start over, you know? You guys gonna be new people, new situations, new places. And I, I met another woman. She was eight years older than me. And I think she wanted children. But by this time, you see, I'd also begun drinking heavily and doing all kinds of drugs, always high when I could manage it. And I'd managed to lower my, well, sperm count to the point where I was effectively infertile. So I couldn't give her a child. And she didn't like that, so she started stepping out on me. She started having affairs uh, within our first year of marriage. And I thought, well, I deserve this. Uh, I, it was a punishment that God was sending me and I would endure it. I wasn't about to have two failed marriages, you know, within five years. So I put up with it and she kept cheating on me at least once a year for the next seven years. And I had a very ill-advised, very passionate affair that wasn't any good for anybody. Life fell apart. I mean, I hadn't been able to hold on to a job for more than three months at a time for long stretches. I finally did get a job that wasn't very demanding and I stayed with it. But this woman and I broke up And I thought, I have got to do something to help myself with this. Because it had been years and years of depression and anger and shame and grief. So I, I went to a therapist. And this therapist said, now, what's the problem? So I told him about this. And then I said, now, I, I had an abortion many years ago. Do you think think that might have something to do with this? And he went, mm, no, no, abortions, you know, it's, it's a regular thing. No, it's not a big deal anymore. Uh, nobody is bothered by abortion. So I thought, well, I still didn't know what was causing my problems. But another thing he said to me is he asked, what is the ideal woman that you're looking for? because I wanted a relationship. I, I was hungry for that. And I said, well, she's gotta be pretty. She's gotta be smart. She's gotta have a sense of humor. She's gotta be generous. She's gotta be kind. She's gotta be willing to experiment on the things that I, I want to do, go out and have new experiences together. And he said, that's very interesting. Why would a woman like that be interested in you. Well, I fired him. Fired him right that minute. But he got me thinking. I really wasn't doing anything to make myself attractive to a woman. 
or attractive to people at all. And I felt least of all attractive to God. So finally, God gave me the grace to recognize what I had done with that abortion. He helped me to realize that I was an accomplice in the murder of my own child. And it broke my heart again. But this time, it broke a heart of stone and put one of flesh inside of me so that I could actually start to heal from it. Because until you know what you've done, you can't repent of it. And if you can't repent of it, God can't forgive you because that's, that's the deal. You acknowledge your sin, you repent of your sin, and God will forgive you no matter what that sin is. So that started my path to healing. And I I'd met Susan, my current wife, uh, my real wife, as I like to call her. Together, we worked on 40 Days for Life program here in Dallas for almost its entire run here. She was in charge of it, and I helped her with that. Um, I went to the uh, Rachel's Vineyard program for men and women who have had abortions, and it helped me tremendously. Susan went with me for support, and uh, I learned a lot of things. I mean, at first I said, well, I don't really need this because now I'm, I'm okay, I'm healed, I've admitted what I've done, God's forgiven me, everything is fine. And I went to Rachel's Vineyard and I discovered that everything wasn't fine. It was there at that retreat that I remembered for the first time since it happened, that second abortion I'd helped with. I completely blotted that out. And it came to me while I was there. And it helped me recognize that the abortion in my past was not some thing, but someone. And I prayed to the Holy Spirit, and I said, tell me who this child was. I realized that she was a girl, and so I named her Elizabeth. Elizabeth was her mother's middle name. It's a family name of ours, too. And then I named her Dolores as well, because it made me sad. So Elizabeth Dolores became my lost child instead of just a fetus that was killed a long time ago. And it helped me reestablish a relationship with her. Jesus led me to her, and that was a major step in my healing. And uh, then they said, you know, Reg, we want to try something just for men, something called Project Joseph. And I said, well, I don't think I need it. I've got a relationship with my child now. I've been, I've been through this. I'm, I'm healed, but I'll go so I can tell other people who need it about it. Well, I went, and I needed it. It helped me realize that there are things that affect a man that uh, aren't, that it's not the same feeling that a woman has from an abortion. I mean, it's not stronger or deeper than the pain a woman feels, but it's just, it's different. Different parts of the man are hurt. His fatherhood is damaged. My fatherhood had been damaged. Now, the second time 
that I had an encounter with Jesus. And it was, it was an actual encounter with him. And I'll confess, I was, I was tripping on acid at the time. I was at a party at what used to be my apartment because, you know, because I couldn't keep a job, I couldn't keep an apartment, so I brought in roommates and things like that to help with it. Uh, I went into the bathroom and I said, Lord, I am so guilty. Help me, forgive me. He came to me, he filled me, he forgave me for all the sins that I confessed. I still didn't confess killing my child because I still couldn't admit that it was wrong. And I came out of that bathroom and I started talking about Jesus to everybody at the party and they thaw, all thought I was crazy. They got to where they would avoid me because I was talking about Jesus all the time. What would Jesus want in this situation? I read the Bible, I read the Gospels back and forward. I, read, I got a book that said, what did Jesus say about it? And I studied it, but people just rejected me. And then finally, uh, one thing I did just after that was I decided that I was going to go find God. So I left my wedding ring on the coffee table. I went out the front door and I went out to Interstate 10 and I put my thumb out and headed west. I had no idea where I was going, but I got rides out and through all of West Texas and through New Mexico and I was into Arizona when I saw what I thought I was looking for. It's this big finger of stone rising up out of the desert. It's called Picacho Peak. And I said, that's where I'm stopping. Drop me off here. And I got out and I climbed that mountain, barehanded, climbed up the side of it. And there was a, there was, you know, there was a state park underneath it. Why nobody stopped me, I don't know, because it wasn't really a safe climb. But I got up just shy of the very peak and I cried out, God, why? Why me? Why, you know, I, I accepted Jesus and why am I still having problems? And God said, why not you? Go down the mountain and cope with it. So I went down the mountain and I hitchhiked back and um, I was strong for a while, but you know, the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I just kept losing, losing my faith. It kept slipping away from me. Although I, I knew Jesus was out there for me, I couldn't, couldn't quite make the real reach out to him. One of the things I did to try and take control of my life was I got into studying magic, which is black magic, because I wanted control of my life. At that time, I didn't recognize that magic is the opposite of prayer. Prayer is where you listen to God and work your will to join it to His. Magic is when you try to bend the universe and the world to your will. And there are demons who will do things for you. The demons are real. Sometimes they're seductive, sometimes they're scary, but they're very real and they hate you. something I call the miracle of the cheese sandwich, started it all off. My wife and I moved, Susan, my, my real wife, we moved to Chicago for two years. And when we were in our apartment, uh, we were there for a few months and our apartment building caught fire. Um, 
we had to find a new place. Uh, it, it, it wasn't easy to find a place in Chicago at the time. And uh, we'd lost clothes, we'd lost all kinds of things. And we went to the local church there, because in Chicago, you, know, you can find a Catholic church, you know, two blocks from the other Catholic church. They're that close. And we went there and we said, we need some help. Can you help? Because I was still, still Catholic, even though I was lapsed and wasn't practicing and was behaving like a pagan. Um, and they brought us in. And the, uh, the church uh, manager made us a cheese and tomato sandwich on white bread with mayonnaise. And it was the best sandwich I'd ever had in my life. It was made with the love of Christ in it. And we started going to church there. Okay, well, the one that uh, means the most to me is uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, which is, be ready to give an explanation for the hope that is in you to anyone who asks you. But be ready to do it with kindness and love. And I live with the hope that I will be able to live with him forever, as all of us. Yeah, I, I wear these medals because each one of them is one of my special patrons and friends. And I've got Mother Teresa's on here and John Paul the, the second. I've got uh, John the Baptist. I've got St. Joseph. I've got St. Anthony. I wear them because it reminds me that I'm part of a communion of saints. And I promise that when you get your medal, I will wear it. So you're committed now. I'm not a Christian because I think I need to be a good person. I'm a Christian because I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and I want to be saved by the grace of Jesus. And I am willing to testify to that and to believe it in my heart and with my mouth. God loves me, and that is why I am so grateful for Jesus, my Savior. My heart is full of life. Your goodness fills my eyes. Are you searching for purpose of life? <laughs> Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.